Welcome to our final portion of our time together today. Um, I think I can speak for everyone here just personally and, and everyone here. Thank you all so much for being with us here in West Virginia, for just encouraging us. Um, Janie, your breakout session was wonderful for the women, and I have a couple questions on that, so don't worry, we're going to get there. Um, but just, gen we, we genuinely, from, you know, the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for just imparting wisdom to us. Um, yeah, give them a round of applause. <laughs> so, like I mentioned, this is our final portion of our time together today. Um, I want to mention a few things, just housekeeping-wise. Um, I'm going to mention this off the top because, uh, quite frankly, I don't want to forget to mention it at the end. So um, don't forget, we have books over here on the, uh, it's my right in the back, 40% um, off. So before you leave, if there's something that you want, make sure to grab that. Um, again, 40% off, so at a, a pretty good discount. Um, when we end, so when our time up here is over, we encourage you to stick around and just fellowship um, hang out, talk, get to know one another. You don't have to leave immediately. Um, we've built time into the, the final portion of the day for you to really fellowship and get to know one another. So we encourage you to do so. And for my New Heights people, uh, New Heights members, we do need some help after we're all finished here to reset for church tomorrow. So um, if you're some of our New Heights people, uh, stick around. Don't sneak out because we need your help to set these chairs back up, okay? Um, I will try to mention that again just to, just to let you know. So um, let's go ahead and go into some questions uh, that, that we have for you guys. I will say, again, my name is Olivia. I don't know if I introduced myself. Um, I'm going to try to speak as, as less as possible and let these two take over. But um, I'm Olivia. I'm a member here at New Heights. Um, so when, when I was first talking with, with Ray and Janie this morning, one of them told me, um, the harder the question, the better. That the was other, you, wasn't it? <laughs> I wasn't going to say Don't which listen one, to him. But the other said, the easier, the better. So um, I wasn't going to rat each of you out with two one of the harder questions. So I think we, maybe we'll meet somewhere, somewhere in between. Um, you can make it as difficult as you would like. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Um, but I am going to start with you, Ray. You took us today from Ecclesiastes to Hebrews, <laughs> and what a journey that was, and just a wonderful job on your part. Um, but something you said in your last sermon, the last session, was this life is not a barrier to get to heaven, to eternal rest, but this life is the track to get there. And I thought that was so profound. And um, as you were talking earlier this morning about futility and really mortality, um, I wanted to ask, why is it important for us to not just accept futility, to not just accept that we are mortal, but to embrace it with hope? That's a profound... You wanted a hard question. Yeah. Is this on? Thanks. That is a profound question. The sooner we accept our erasure from the world, the less frustrated and angry we'll be. Um, and the freer at heart to redirect our whole sense of purpose and direction and mission toward eternity, toward Jesus. What holds me back is, so often, is um, misplaced desire. Something really dumb weighed on deep inside me, the Bible calls it sin, is spring-loaded to look at what will break my heart as if that will make my heart. The more I see through that, the, the fraudulent promises that this world cannot keep and the glorious promises God cannot fail to keep. That doesn't mean I despise this life. It just means I hold it with open hands while I'm running toward ridiculous eternal joy. Yeah, that's good. Janie, what about you when you look at your your life and um, just where you are now, how, you know, your, your journey um, in the faith, what hope or hope do you 
hope uh, that your life um, will speak to uh, when, you, when you look at where you've come. I hope my life will speak to the coming generations. Psalm 78, of my own hope that God is worth it, that he really is worth it. I hope my children, we have four married children, I hope that my children-in-law and that our grandchildren will see a woman who gave it all with joy and counted it as joy because it is. Yeah, that's good. That kind of leads me into into our next question. Um, I, for one, I'm so encouraged by the amount of women who are here today, um, and I we, I know that we were all encouraged by your breakout, Janie. Um, so I want to touch on some things so the guys in here who weren't in there can can hear about it because I think they need to hear it too. Um, but there's something that I, I've heard you say actually on a podcast I was listening to. Um, you were talking about joyful exhaustion. And uh, there was a quote that you said, you may not remember this, I promise I wasn't stalking you, it was a podcast um, (laughs) that's out there for everybody, Uh, but you you said um, that at the end of your life, you want to fall at the feet of Jesus exhausted with joy. And I loved that, That, that's such an encouragement to us. And so um, I want to talk a little more about this idea of joyful exhaustion, you know, where we're, the theme of today is hope for a weary church, hope for, you know, weary ministers, for members of the local church. Um, but in our weariness, I think that we can steward that for good. And I think that, you know, you touched on that beautifully. Um, so talk a little more about how we can steward our weariness for good and this idea of joyful exhaustion. That's a good question. I, I wish I could use my own life as an example. I don't think I do that very well all the time. I know. <laughs> um, what I'm getting at is when I see Jesus, I want to be able to totally collapse there and say, yes, my final step, I made it across, Lord. And I was just, as Ray has taught us at Emmanuel, ruggedly defiant, cheerfully defiant, that there's a real enemy and there is a real Lord. And the Lord is more powerful than my enemy. And so I do everything I can. I try to get a reasonable amount of sleep. I try to eat healthy food and all those good things of self-care but I still end up tired at times. That's okay. It's a reminder that there is a God in heaven and I am not God. I'm a a servant. And because I'm called his servant, that means I'm his responsibility. He'll take care of me. He owns me. He loves me. He gave himself for me. So that fatigue that I feel can be a a glorious sacrifice rather than a weary depression. It can be, oh, I'm I'm feeling kind of tired. So I, I go to bed, or I have a cup of tea, or I go on a walk, and I'm a little bit more refreshed for a while. Then I give, and then I grow tired again. I mean, it's, it's that pattern, but it's for a purpose. And it's the purpose, as darling, you so beautifully gave us just now in Hebrews. Thank you. Uh, it, it's that that set before me, that keeps me going, not self-care or self-focus. Is that what you're yes, driving at, great. Olivia? <laughs> Thank you. Um, what about you, Ray? Well, say kind of same question, but maybe for the pastors in the room from a pastoral place, leadership place, talking about weariness and um, being joyfully exhausted for the sake of your church. One thing I miss about being a pastor full-time is the, the weekly sprint. I would always take Monday off. You've got to have a day off. Um, for the purpose of rejuvenation, so you can work again. In the world, people work in order to play. Among the saints, we play in order to work. 
you got to play. For us, during all those years of pastoral ministry, Monday was our day together, totally off, no church stuff at all. Tuesday through Sunday, the sprint. I miss it. <laughs> You're going to miss it. Why not enjoy it right now while you've got it? I miss the meetings with people I respected and enjoyed. I miss the routine of it. I love a routine. A routine is incredibly productive. That well-worn groove I ran through every week, I got a lot of work done. Sermon prep and all this other stuff. I miss that. It was an extreme discipline and incredibly fruitful. It felt good. It got me worn out and depressed every week. <laughs> but I got a lot of stuff done. By the way, let me think of his name. Archibald Hart taught at the Fuller School of Psych for many years. I was listening to some lectures he was giving to pastors in Australia years ago. He said, one of the reasons why, after you've given yourself for a stretch in vigorous ministry, why you go into, you sink into feelings of failure, feelings of utility, even depression. He said, There's part of the reason is your adrenal gland is replenishing for the next big push. And your body is being drawn upon by the adrenal gland to get you ready for what's next. So when you feel depleted and you feel low, it's not because anything is going wrong, it's because something is going right. Your body knows better than you do. It is saying, chill for a while, I'm getting you ready. So you can say yes to that and say, all right, I'm gonna go take a nap, I'm gonna go take a walk, I'm gonna go to bed early, I'm gonna take a unison tonight, and I'm gonna sleep for nine hours because I'm gonna need it this next week. So. Figure out, what I'm saying is, pastor, figure out that rhythm, that track that you can run on a weekly basis that you're going to run and run and run and run, and you're going to love it. You're going to accomplish so much. Just make it sustainable. That's good. So um, that's your pastor hat. Let's put on the husband hat and the father hat for a minute yeah. and talk about the sprint, what it was like. Um, with the balance, you know, the sprint of being, right. being that, what you just spoke about, but then yeah. your life at home, um, some encouragement yeah. to that. Be, being faithful to your wife is not just not having sex with another woman. Being faithful to your wife is a positive thing. You are attending to her faithfully so that she knows she matters more to you than anybody else on the face of the earth. That's faithfulness. Um, when the kids are little, Janie and I had three kids in three years. Less than three, less than three years. Bless you. That is insanity. <laughs> now, little kids, a house full of little kids, that is not a death sentence, <laughs> except to our selfishness, which we don't want anyway. Why not enjoy it? And build out a daily routine, routine like, okay, dinner, and then tubby time, cleaning them up, and then getting them in their jammies, and reading Winnie the Pooh together, sitting on the sofa in the front room, singing a little song, patting their little behinds to sleep, and then going back out to the sofa and collapsing. And just do that day after day after day, and have a blast. Your kids did not ask to be born into your family. It's your fault. <laughs> they didn't apply for the job, they can't be fired. You deserve, they owe, excuse me, you owe them the best start in life you can give them. Amen. So give it and enjoy it. Children feel loved when they know they're enjoyed. That's not an all-approving, everything they do is adorable 
sometimes they are downright naughty. But it is just a joy to have them at all. I will add that um, I was the one there most of the time with the children, especially when they were young. We had four, and it was busy all the time. But Ray would make specific times for individual children, our daughter included. We have three. As they got older, he'd take them out, or he would just call one of them into our bedroom and just sit and talk and pray with them. He spent that individual time so the child knew I matter to dad. He, he's thinking about me. He was there for their games, their practices, Krista's show jumping. I mean, he was there and it meant a lot to our kids and he sacrificed for it. That meant he'd be up later that night working. Yeah. Um, that's really good. Thank you all for that, for that encouragement. I want to circle back to something that I'd mentioned earlier about the women in the room um, and some things that we talked about during uh, Janie's talk. Um, she encouraged us uh, really in, in Mark 14 and verse 8. I told you that's one of my favorite verses. She has done what she could. And um, what a beautiful gift that is, that Jesus said that to Mary and that he says that to us, that we have done what, what we could, what is available to us, and doing that well. Um, I want to pose the question first maybe to you, Ray, about particularly women in our churches as a pastor. You've pastored for many years. What, um, why, and then, you know, what's the value that you saw and how important it was to champion the women in your churches, whether that be the young mom who's discipling her kids at home, or maybe that's a women's minister. You know, whatever it looks like within our churches, women are a vital part of that. And I want to hear from you pastorally, um, just to speak into, as you're leading, how important that was in creating that space. Yeah. Um, this is easier for me to do now that I'm 72 years old, because I have a sort of fatherly thing going that I didn't have earlier, right? It was more brotherly before. But every pastor at any stage of life can find a way to do this. Walk into the worship space on Sunday morning early. Get there before you need to get there, because there are going to be people in there who will be feeling invisible, not needed, not significant. Walk in. Don't pay attention to your friends. Quietly have conversations with them along the way. Y'all, I love you, but I will ignore you on Sunday morning. Because we can talk anytime. Walk in and look especially for a woman who is alone. Maybe she looks awkward as a, a person alone. I am not okay. My Pastor Ray is not okay with anybody feeling awkward, feeling invisible, feeling unwanted, and especially if that's a woman. So I make a gentle, this has got to be wise, gently approach that person Hold out your hand, shake your hand, say, hi, my name is Ray, what's your name? And look, look her in the eyes with sincerity and friendship and thank her for coming. And just, I mean, you'll read the situation real time, moment by moment. The, sit, the conversation might go somewhere, it might not. You, you, you can have a feel for that, but Everybody walking in, especially someone who might feel marginal, if you can just discern that, who feels marginal? Well, not on my watch. You are there for people to feel less marginal and more included and more significant and like you. You're saying to them, you so matter. So... We could talk about how women lead in ministry and all that stuff. That's great. I'm all for it. But Pastor Ray walking into a room and Pastor you 
walking into a room, there's something you can do about it that doesn't require approval by the elders. You just get after it when you walk in the room. That's what I'm saying. Do you have anything to add, Janie? Okay. Um, oh, I have something to add. Sorry. Please, please do. It's better when Janie is with me, obviously. <laughs> All right. Uh, then it's, it's impossible to misunderstand. But oftentimes she's involved in ministry elsewhere, just to be clear about that. So um, we, we don't have a whole lot of time left, unfortunately. Um, well, maybe fortunately for you two. You might be uh, tired of me grilling you up here. Um, <laughs> but maybe a couple more questions. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, just your partnership, your marriage, and just some encouragement for, for um, a lot of us here and maybe even for singles who are here um, when it comes to um, partnering with one another. What have you found, Janie, I'm going to ask you first, what have you found to be really most valuable and helpful for you in supporting Ray for Ray? So not just Pastor Ray, not just author and speaker Ray, but um, what is, what's been most helpful and valuable for you in just Janie supporting her partner, her husband, Ray? I think, Olivia, the most important thing for me would be to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with everything I have. If I am looking to Christ and finding my rest in him alone, then Ray doesn't have to make up my psychological and emotional deficiencies. But God is there for me. So out of the overflow of my heart, then, I can love and care for this man that I get to spend my life with. That's great. What about you, Ray? Same question. Two thoughts. One, I'm embarrassed by my selfishness and obliviousness toward this precious lady God gave me oh, to be my wife. Stop I, it. That's awful. No, I, no I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sorry about that. I'm just... Okay, second thought. Now, this is amazing to me. So, I want faithfully, lovingly, respectfully, tenderly to attend to her so that she doesn't feel taken for granted. The other thought is, she has empowered me in the course of our life greatly by being a woman, a serious uh, woman of God. I have never once seen Janie put her foot down and say no to Christ. I'm not, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not going to obey you because I'm sorry, you're just going to look, look the other way this time because my needs are such that I'm going this direction even though you are obviously calling me to go that direction. I've never once seen her do that. She has followed Jesus all these years with the result that I have been hugely empowered to follow Jesus. My wife by being the kind of woman she said a moment ago, loving Christ first above all else has helped me to love Christ above all else. Now, I'm not making my walk with the Lord her responsibility. I'm just saying she has been a massive turbocharged encouragement in Christ to me just by being a, you know, a formidable woman of God. I owe you big time. We've got these witnesses. <laughs> Let's see here. Is there a jewelry store around here? <laughs> Maybe we can get that on recording and send it to you guys. <laughs> All right, so a final question, and we'll kind of end with this as a final exhortation to everyone. 
Um, we've talked a lot about generations and what it means to um, see the generations ahead of us and, and to really enjoy their work and to be encouraged by that and then what we leave behind. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that, the latter part of that, in, um, in, in talking about discipling not just a generations but generations and generations and generations, Lord willing, they come behind us. Um, what is a final piece of advice you would maybe give us um, as we are doing that work on the ground, just as you both continue to do that work on the ground in our churches and in our families, um, what's a final piece you know, of encouragement you would give us as we seek to disciple um, the generation behind us, whatever generation that may be? That's just such a great question. Can we take till about four o'clock on that? <laughs> oh my. I'll be here as long as you want to talk. <laughs> well, we'll keep this short. Um, Ray and I feel that more and more keenly now in our 70s. We want our 70s to be our most productive decade. Why shouldn't it be? The Lord has kindly poured into us. We owe him everything. And we have so much now. This should be our most productive decade so far. And Ray and I are asking the Lord to help us to look out beyond our children and grandchildren. We are praying to the 10th generation um, that our work now in our children and grandchildren will be of a lasting nature that will spread out. So we're trying to invest in our children and our grandchildren despite our ministry schedule. We make them a priority. We try to spend time with them and call them and write them and some live overseas and some live far away in California, that kind of thing. But we make that effort because we want the love of Jesus and the beauty of Jesus to be passed on from generation to generation to generation until he comes again. And we want to help that, not hinder it. One thing we can do of a concrete nature is to leave behind well-worn, marked-up Bibles. Oh, that's good. Um, what, obviously, you know, in the context of human reality that is not grumpy. You know, grumpy Christians deny Christ. Life-filled, life-giving people exhibit Christ. If I can be a non-grumpy old man, life-giving, and that with, with, with something human and beautiful to offer my grandchildren, and that kind of guy leaves behind a well-worn Bible, a bunch of them, I think that says something, and that can last. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all so much for your time. It's our privilege. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, give them a round of applause.